Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. Now we're going to have a conversation about how we can continue to keep government accountable and transparent in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. You remember a lot of restrictions and of course a lot of things have come up since COVID-19 first hit our shores in March this year and one of them being the lockdown and how a lot of people had questions for government about why they first of all instituted a partial lockdown in Accra and also in Greater Kumasi like they mentioned why it was necessary to feed uh, which groups of people were allowed to move around during the lockdown and all of that then also there was another issue about uh, a top Ghana health service official who once said that Ghana had reached its peak of COVID-19 infections that also generated a whole lot of controversy uh, questions here and there about what the science and data was behind uh, that decision that he made. And later, Ghana recorded even higher cases than when it was announced that we had reached our peak. So clearly, we were nowhere near flattening our curve. There also have been a lot of questions asked about the decision to uh, allow some students to go back to school to write their exams. So you realize that citizens have been very alert in terms of how government has managed COVID-19, even with the statistics that were put out there about how many people had developed the virus and how many people, you know, were discharged after the new WHO protocols. And so today we're going to be asking the question that, aside citizens, how have the CSOs also, um, you know, played a role in ensuring that government remains accountable and, of course, provides the transparent information uh, that we need? And joining us this morning, we have Reverend uh, Sister Regina Ignatia Afla. She's the coordinator for Human Rights and justice. Now, she is also the executive assistant to Executive Secretary of Caritas Ghana, and Regina is also a lawyer. Good morning, sister, and welcome. Thank you. Good All right. Morning. And we also have Kwejo Oting Owusu, who's the national coordinator for the Ghana CSO's platforms on SDGs. Good to have you as well. Good to be here. So, so first of all, please break it down for me. When we mention the institutions that you work with and work for, what exactly is your role when it comes to this particular issue? Thank you very much. So the Ghana Civil Society platform um, on the SDGs is a, it's a national platform um, mm. com consisting of, uh, at our last count, close to 400 or more mm. COCs working across the, the, breadth, the width and breadth of the country. Okay. Um, very, the, because it's, it's a collection of CSOs, everyone has its own area of focus and area of expertise. Mm. So, we have those who are into anti-corruption, those who are into um, women empowerment, those who are into um, child rights, so water rights. So it cuts across. But we are organized, as our name suggests, along the, um, or motivated along the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Okay. And so um, as a platform, we have 17 national um, sub-platforms organized along the goals. Mm -hmm. We have um, a platform for youth, which is our, our 18 sub platform. And in recent times, we have decentralized to have district sub platforms. And so basically, within, within 14 districts now, we have uh, our members who engage, discuss, and, and, and engage with the local assembly, okay. with, with citizens on how to be part of the implementation of the SDGs. I see. What about you, Reverend Sister? So, what exactly do you also do? Yeah. As um, an S uh, CSO, CSO, yes, yes, Caritas Ghana is the humanitarian agent of the Catholic Bishops Conference, okay. and we seek to implement policies from the Catholic Bishop Conference. We take in charge of humanitarian services, trying to see how we can help the vulnerable in society. We do some of those things through. Uh, advocacy, mm. training, we do public policy, we do some uh, other things like we support child trafficking. Okay. And during the COVID-19, Caritas Ghana has been engaged in doing a lot of things, reaching out to the public, okay. especially the vulnerable in society. Well, if we're going to talk about government and holding them accountable, then we also need to understand your response to COVID-19 and what your CSOs have done as well. So would you, you tell me yours first? So if, if um, and, and I know uh, viewers would know, civil society organizations, uh, are, our role is a bit peculiar. Peculiar in the sense that um, when, when in a pandemic situation such as this, everything boils down to funding. Okay. Civil society organizations, the, the money that comes to us always come 
tied to a set of objectives, set of activities. And so once a pandemic comes and things are thrown up and down, we, we quickly had meetings and discussions to see how do we respond mm -hmm. in this situation. And so on our part, we had discussions with some of our strategic partners and um, people who are not necessarily our members, but who share our vision. And we established a civil society, what we call the CSO COVID Response Fund. Um, and this was our attempt to mobilize funds from within our membership to see what we can do to support. And um, Star Ghana, for instance, came on board. The Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition also came on board. Mm. Um, the West African Civil Society Institute and a lot more came on board. And we raised small, uh, well, a meager amount of money, not huge. Okay. Uh, our pockets are not that deep. It's understandable. And so we were able to raise, um, as are now close to 120,000 cities, okay. which um, we have used um, during just around the lockdown period. We, we bought some food items, some rice, some oil, some water, some vitamins, shared it amongst um, people who, whom we considered as our constituents, mm. persons with disabilities, the aged, the mental health, street children, basically within Kumasi and Accra, um, because these were the areas under the uh, mm. affected by the partial lockdown. On that score, we were able to reach around 1,500 mm -mm. people. Our recent, which we call our phase two on that fund, has been um, the acquisition of some face masks and um, some IEC materials. Mm -hmm. we, we recognize that with the changing dynamics in our fight against the COVID, education is key, sensitization is key. And so we've been able to procure um, around 9,000 IEC sticker materials, which um, we'll be sharing to our members. Procurement is done. Um, we are just taking the boxes as it were. Okay. So we don't, we don't have any, because it's not our money, we don't fall into issues later on with accountability. So that means you've done quite a lot in terms of supporting people yeah. across the country. We w have. What about you, Reverend Sister? Because of course, the COVID-19 also left us with a floundering economy. And that in itself also would affect economic rights of the citizens in the country and other rights as well. So if you're talking about Caritas and the fact that you're focused more on the basic human rights of people, what exactly have you been able to do as um, you know, a CSO to support people and their rights in the country? Okay, so since the outbreak of COVID-19, the Bishop's Conference came out with a plan. And as I said earlier on, Caritas Ghana is the humanitarian agency mm. that implements policies of the Bishop's Conference. So we took that plan up to see how best we can bring some relief to the citizen, especially the vulnerable in society. So what we've been doing is it cuts across the whole of Ghana the Catholic Church has 20 uh, dioceses, so we work with those dioceses. What we do is uh, we get fun and support from donors, and we share this mm. with the dioceses who can reach out to members in their community. Okay. But what we also did was during the lockdown, we went to Agbogloshi to donate some food items to those who are affected, and those food structures were demolish in Agbogloshi. Mm. So we went out to them. Uh, during that time, to part of our team went to Kumasi to see how they can attend to the Kaya Yes who were supposed to leave Kumasi at that time and go back to uh, their home mm. and their places of work. So we went to that place. We went to uh, Kaswa to provide food support mm. to the vulnerable and people living with disability. Okay. As if it wasn't enough, we also got some donation from the Taiwan government, PPEs in form of face masks, okay. which we distributed to all the 20 dioceses to support especially health workers so that at least they are protected and attend to those people. Uh, we are also training the Kaya Yes so that they can get something on their hands and work on in form of economic gain. So during that time, this is what Caritas was doing. And of course, in providing support, you engage them as well. What are some yes. of the information that you picked from them in terms of how they've been able to manage COVID-19, how it's affected them through and through up until this point? Yeah, it was difficult for them. Many of them said they couldn't have places to sleep, no abode for them. Mm. And moving from one place to another was difficult for them. So with this sort of training, 
how do we empower these people so that they protect themselves against the COVID-19? So we organized uh, some training for them. We also organized um, workshops to see how best to integrate them and teach them how to do small, small training to get something from them, uh, for themselves. Okay. Even though the coronavirus is there, they will need to leave. Mm. So these are some of the things that we did. And we also engage them through the MMDAs, the Municipal District Assembly. Yeah. We engage them through that. And we are still doing that, going around, having uh, engagements, having dialogue with mm. them, and bringing this, especially the Kaya on board, on board, and see how to empower them to be on their own. Did they by any chance share with you their thoughts on government's response to COVID-19? Yes. OK. Yes, some did. Um, we realized that the, at the outbreak, the onset of the outbreak, the president has always been on television to address the nation mm -hmm. about progress of COVID-19. But unfortunately, these people didn't have the opportunity or they have no opportunity to listen to the president. So it's really, really affected them. Most of them said they are not aware of what is going on. Mm. Most of them said they have no food to eat. Mm. And that is the problem to them. So they didn't really understand what was going on because some do not have television, some will mm. have to travel from one place to the other to listen to news, yeah. which the Korean do. So those are some of the things that they share with them. And some also share with us when there was supposed to be food, food distribution, yeah. how they were neglected. Some of them were neglected. They didn't get those ones. Of course, some benefited from yeah. it, but some also didn't uh, get access to that. Hmm. So these are some of the things that they discuss with us. But as I said earlier on, we provide food items to see how best we can support these people also to live and have a living for themselves. Kojo, what about you? I mean, I find this challenging, especially because governments had indicated that all of the president's addresses were going to be translated into different languages yeah. and distributed across the country so that all those who could not necessarily understand his address in English would also get the chance to understand. I think there were also, you know, ways by which they were ensuring that they reached the masses by engaging them, you know, physically and all of that. What about you, when you were engaging these people, did they also come up with such, you know, issues and how bad was it? Well, well if, if I say it's bad, they may say I'm being political, but the feedback we've had um, from, from our membership, Caritas being one of them and, and all the other CSOs doing marvelous work across the country have been that information dissemination on on COVID, COVID itself, it seems to to be concentrated in, in the bigger urban areas. So okay. the Accra, the Kumases, and then recently when there were some cases in, in, in Takra Day, mm. we, people suddenly became aware. But generally in the rural regions, information dissemination on COVID, the protocols, the mm. behaviors, the, the agency that you see in Accra doesn't seem to... Um, to exist beyond, um, well, if I may say beyond Sunyani, but I don't want to generalize. Of but course. some of the feedback we've had from the Upper West, for instance, the Upper East, for instance, has been that people are going about things as if um, um, nothing else is at stake. You know, even before um, schools were reopening, even before the measures were being relaxed, um, and People were just doing things, having their own wedding ceremonies mm. and going to market. There were no face marks have been an issue. Um, so, yeah, But of course, government did say that it was mandatory to even wear face masks. And people who flouted the lockdown rules. I remember there was a wedding that took place some part of Ghana. Yeah. And they were arrested for yeah. it. And so these people also did not have an excuse. Yeah. Because they were very much aware yeah. of the law that had been instituted at that time. So is it, is it unf not unfair to say that the information did not get to a lot of these people? I think to, to a large extent, um, the challenge has been that enforcement of the laws have been, have been, have been challenged in itself. Mm. And, and because it has been challenged, um, it, on one hand, you want to blame government. On the other hand, you also want to ask who is supposed to do it beyond the central government? Mm -hmm. and, and why is it not happening? And, 
and have they received the, the resources to do it? Because we know that um, the, there was a district response teams that were put together, similar yeah. to what we have um, at the national level. Were they given the enough resources they needed to, to function? Did they have the political role to function? Because we, obviously we are, not, um, we are not oblivious of the fact that this is a political year. And so sometimes some of these decisions, um, but for us, our ultimate response to, to this is that if, if there was sense or there was reason to, to implement these laws, then let's see it through. Because at the end of the day, these are citizens who get infected. These are mm. citizens whose businesses have been disrupted. These are citizens whose children are, in, are home and are asking when are they going to school. Um, some that have the means. Our focus is on the vulnerable. Those yeah. that have the means may have um, private tutoring going on. But what of those that don't have the means? Uh, my, my mother's village, my mm -hmm. father's village. Do, they're voiceless. How do they survive this? Um, and so we, we, the, the, the major feedback we've, we've also had has been that if, if government says we are doing well, well, how come the numbers keep rising? How come we have new, we seem to have new infections Every day. What are we and not doing? And this is based on your opinion gathered from. Yes. What okay. are we not doing right? Your projects. That okay. it seems that um, today is a thousand. The next day we are still having infections. Mm -hmm. What are we not doing right? So mm. it is a question to us, but it's a question to all of us. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's some of the feedback um, on some of the policy measures that government has implemented on the business, um, the stimulus package, mm -hmm. um, the COVID alleviation program, business support scheme. There have been questions around a bit around the transparency. Mm -hmm. um, people apply. There's no follow through. You are not. You you don't get to know why. Um, at least that's what we've heard. But as to whether MBSSI will will follow through on that. What exactly? I didn't get exactly people, what people people are apply, about. and there's basically that no response. You don't there are people get to, who apply with no response. Yeah, you don't get to know or are still waiting to know whether their applications are being processed or... How like long they, have they been waiting? Since the applications have been opened. Really? Because Madame Kosi Yankee also gave a different assessment of what was happening. Uh, and the fact that it was even open for more people. I think recently she gave an, a figure, I think about 700,000 or so people, if I'm, if I'm not right... Uh, Forgive me for that, but, but she did mention that a lot of people had applied and they were, of course, engaging them to see how many of them were eligible. The portal, um, the portal is closed. Yeah. So I don't know how people will apply now. No, that's what I'm saying, that she did mention that a number of people had applied and, of course, they were assessing them to see how many uh, were going to get it as well. So the indication was that everything was fine, everybody was being responded to. So I find that interesting. We might have to cross over to her sometime and ask her, uh, for updates on that. But Reverend Sister, what about you as well? Did the opinions of these people that you worked with and on influence your assessment of government's management? And I'm saying you in terms of the CSO, not individual, by the way. Uh, tell me what your assessment of government's management has been. Yes, I think so far government has done the best they can. They, can done, they, can, they have done the best that um, they can. The only thing that they keep on mentioning is uh, some of them told us that they heard of COVID-19 trust fund. Mm -hmm. And so that fund, how is it being used? How is it being managed? Mm. So it becomes a bit difficult for us to explain to them because we ourselves don't know. We don't know how the fund is being um, managed. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, we are not able to um, uh, explain to them. So we think that what people are expecting is for government to be open up, to be able to tell we the citizens what they are really using the funds for mm -hmm. and who will benefit, who is not benefiting. Uh -huh. I think that if all those things are said or are done by the government, the citizen will appreciate it the more than keeping us in the dark and doing things behind. Of course, they do this, do, some of those things for our own benefit. Mm -hmm. But if we don't know them, it becomes difficult to accept those, those, those things. Uh, example is like, even um, I think we heard on the radio or television about the issue at Rich Hospital, 
where some people even have to sell face masks mm. and all that. Mm. If government is really monitoring and checking how some of the money and the investment they have put in place, if they are really monitoring them, I think some of these things will not happen. Yeah, yeah. So the vulnerable will not sit there. So we have seen this, we have seen that, but we are not benefiting from it. Okay. So in that regard, that is what I'll have to so say. So deducing from what you've just said, government have, has done well, but there's still some lacking yes, in terms of account room accountability. For improvement. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about you? I mean, I'm coming back to you again because you had just mentioned MBSS. So I had to just throw it to Reverend Sister as well. But moving forward, recently uh, the MPP launched this manifesto. And this is not a political conversation, by the way, but they even stated in their manifesto the way forward from COVID 19. And they talked about the Ghana cares and a lot of other things that they intend to put in place to ensure that the economy is revamped. How updated are citizens across the country about some of these things and how they can also access? some funds from from our engagement and from the feedback from our membership i don't think that um, citizens are really in tune with with the um, post covid the post covid recovery plan or post covid situation if if i may put it that way it's good the mpp has captured it in their in their manifesto i would have wished that we don't get into the the situation where covid becomes a political mm. discussion especially because of how ghana uh, political discussions are mm -hmm. it, it gets it gets um, we seem to lose sight of the the priorities when political sentiments are introduced but so um, this should have been a national plan devoid yes, of politics because the covid it doesn't appear to anybody that mm. covid will go away anytime soon so i think that we should have a much more long term discussion on Post-COVID, it mm -hmm. shouldn't be just in a manifesto, but post-COVID in the next five years, in the next 20 years. If mm -hmm. you check the mid-term um, supplementary budget the finance minister recently um, put, out, yeah. put out, you realize that all the indicators show that from the World Bank, from the AMF, that there will be a recession. Mm -hmm. And so we should have the discussion within that global context, not just look within Ghana and have and MPP said this, because I'm sure once the NDC manifesto comes out, obviously we will have, have that kind we? of um, comparative discussion, which may make us lose sight of the fact that this is something more of a long-term situation that requires all of us making our input. As Reverend Sister mentioned, if civil society organizations themselves are not well briefed mm -hmm. on the issues, we can't do our, our role of sensitizing the public or the citizenry on how to tag in, where to enter. I mean, the are, entry are you point. saying you're not well briefed? You've not uh, been engaged enough by government? That I, I would not. We have been engaged, but okay. not, That's why not, I added. Yeah, not enough. Um, okay. we, we had a session where the information minister, deputy information minister joined in, and he mentioned, in, in, he mentioned to say that, I mean, government cannot openly uh, be engaged with civil society in a way to corrupt the independence of the civil society organization. Mm. But I think that in as much as we respect that opinion, this, this, this should be seen as an all hands on deck scenario. Okay. Um, ideally, civil society would want to come at government, be, be chastising. But if, if you have noticed, it, it has been a bit on the tone down mm. because this is, we are not in normal times. Nobody gains by pulling anybody down. So our sense. focus is on the same people government has focused on, the poor, the vulnerable. So how do we come together and ensure that at the end of the day, the Kaya who is the most vulnerable or mm -hmm. the, the old lady who is the most vulnerable, we all get through together. At okay. the end of the day, we all have life. Reverend, I'll come to you to take your final words before we wrap up. And so moving forward, what advice would you give to government in terms of engaging the CSOs even more? Uh, because clearly you have worked closely with these people and so you understand what their needs are and why it's important to formulate policies that will be beneficial to them. What advice do you have for government? I think government should be able to engage the district assemblies because they are working for them. And mm. if they have no education or they have no information, or they don't understand how or where government is moving towards, it will be difficult for them to work. Mm. So government should be able to uh, empower them so that they can do the work from the district. Because 
whether we like it or not, the district is where everything happens. And I also say that we as um, CSOs must also embrace government plans so that together we can all work to move uh, Ghana forward. Absolutely. I think that is what I can live with government. Thank you so much, both of you, for speaking to us this morning. And we hope that a lot will be done. As always, we touch on the very pertinent issues in society, um, of course, as a result of COVID-19 and its adverse effect on the economy. I've been speaking to Reverend Sister Regina Ignatia Afla. She's a coordinator for the Human Rights and Justice. She's a lawyer and also the Executive Assistant to Executive Secretary of Caritas Ghana. And quick, Joe Oting Owusu is the National Coordinator for the Ghana CSOs Platform on SDGs.